the CEOs and the leaders, yes, they're smart. Yes, they, they have a certain skill set. But the companies that set themselves apart, the CEOs and the leaders or presidents, they're excellent recruiters and they're excellent at putting the right people in the right positions to give them the best chance to succeed. Welcome to Anything and Everything. I'm your host, Angelo Esposito, bringing you compelling chronicles of entrepreneurship, where success means doing anything and everything. Welcome to another episode of Anything and Everything. We're here today with Curtis Killen, president of KBD Insurance, or Assurance KVD uh, yeah. for my French speaking people. Um, Curtis, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, it's great to have you. So, really, you know, the concept behind anything and everything is we love to talk to entrepreneurs and business owners about how generally they're willing to do anything and everything to make their business work, think outside the box, work late hours, just like figure things out. And they're very resourceful. And I'd love to maybe hear, you know, your story. So maybe to just kick things off, can we just maybe get a little high level overview? What is KBD insurance just as a starting point? Very simple. So we are an insurance brokerage. Um, some people in America refer to it as insurance agency. We offer home insurance, car insurance, business insurance, very straightforward. Got property it. and liability insurance. Um, that's the the premise of it. But I, I, as we were discussing before earlier, I don't want to bore the audience too, too, too much with a, a lot of insurance talk. We'll focus more on the, uh, yeah, <coughs> the overview and the uh, entrepreneurial side of things. Yeah, so don't worry. Uh, uh, don't worry, audience. We're, I'm not going to bore <laughs> you with insurance. <laughs> no, I think it's fascinating, like just how people get into ventures and how they build it up and how they think about it. So really, I think we'll, we'll be able to touch a lot of topics. I mean, one of the first things I wanted to kind of address was like, I, I noticed that K, KBD was recognized as one of Canada's fastest growing companies. I'd love to hear from you. Like, what would you attribute that, that rapid growth, uh, you know, and success to? So uh, a, a few things. Number one, it always helps to have a really good team. Um, and I mean, insurance, it's 70% of the job is just business development. And I think you can say that about a lot of companies and just to kind of like put it into perspective, like there's a lot of insure tech companies that actually had a really good product, but they thought that the business was just going to come to them. So a lot of them ended up failing. The, the job in insurance is basically 70% of its business development. You can say that about tech, you can say that about, it's so rare to have like a viral product, like a Facebook or an Instagram where it, it sells itself and it's literally viral and there's millions right. of people per day subscribing down the app. So here it's a little different. You gotta be in the offense of all times, uh, at all times. So definitely just having that mentality of we got to be on the offense. We need to be contacting people. We need to be exposing our brand um, to the world, whether that's through traditional media uh, advertising, whether that's through digital media advertising. Mm -hmm. And so I would definitely say those two things, just being on the offense, um, trying to brand yourself, expose your brand, get people to know who you are and having a really good team. I mean, you could basically say this about any company, right? So uh, I would definitely say that that's uh, one of the reasons why we've been on Canada's uh, top 400 fastest growing companies. And, awesome. um, but, but honestly, like the, the, the team is, that's another thing that I learned that I'm learning. A lot of companies, the CEOs and the leaders, yes, they're smart. Yes, they, they have a certain skill set, but the companies that set themselves apart the CEOs and the leaders or presidents, they're excellent recruiters and they're excellent at putting the right people in the right positions Correct. to give them the best chance to succeed. And that's literally like all it is. Just get the right people, treat them well, offer them upper mobility. Obviously uh, pay is, is one of the factors, but it's not the most important factor. And yeah, if you kind of have all those things together, I think a lot of companies uh, will have success. Awesome. Yeah, very well said. And I, and I think there's definitely a learning there, you know, for fellow entrepreneurs listening, like something I learned too, just how important the a being able to identify, recruit, you know, inspire, find the right people, put them in the right place. And then one thing that I showed them with that I got a lot better at is just like giving them the kind of clear path or clear ladder to success. Um, it's something that because I've never worked at a big company, it's like it's not important to me, obviously, because my company. So I'm just working. I'll do whatever I got to do. But then I realized over time, it's like when you do find people that are highly motivated, they generally like seeing like, 
like you kind of alluded to, upward mobility. How do they grow within this company? And I think that's one thing people can take away is how do you show them a clear path of this is where you are today, this is how, where you can go if you hit you know X, Y, Z, or if we achieve yeah. these milestones. And, yeah. and that clarity just goes a long way. Yeah, uh, upward mobility, especially for your top performers. I mean, if you don't offer them upward mobility, they're not going to stay because they're right. just going to get bored. Even if you offer them like higher pay and it's a, a good competitive pay, some will, but most of them won't. They're they're going to leave because right. they want to have that intellectual stimulation. They want to try new things. They want to, you know, they want to get some dirt underneath of their nails. Yeah. And these are the types of people that obviously you, you want to have around to help build a business. And, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes you also have to be realistic where, you know, I've had people in the past as well that I wanted to offer them upward mobility, but I didn't have a position at the time. And so I've gone the other way too, where you try and give them that upward mobility. And what ended up happening is I just had a bloated payroll. So you you want to kind of find that Balance. sweet spot. Yeah. And sometimes uh, if you can't offer them that upward mobility, just be straight up with them. And you just have to kind of accept the fact that you know, there is a chance they're they're going to leave and you right. can't be mad at them for that. Right. And then how do you handle, for example, one thing that that, you know, I learned <laughs> is, you know, kind of the old saying, I'm sure you've heard of it, but um, <clears throat> hire slow, fire fast. Right. Like how do you, yeah. you know, ideally, you know, so how do you deal with kind of that? I'm sure there's a lot of turnover in the industry, like any tips or tricks when, when, when you deal with number one, finding a talent and then number two, yeah. like. If they are not a good fit, I mean, ideally you, you, you get better at the hiring part, but when you when you do kind of make mistakes and, not, and it won't always work out, how do you handle the flip side of that? Uh, so hiring, we've been pretty successful with hiring just because, again, we're, we're on the offense and a lot of people say, ah, oh, it's so difficult to hire. It is difficult to hire, but if you put the time into it, like you're, you'll get people to come. You just have to right. put the time into it. Um, and, and it's it's not easy, but it's, it's the same thing as as selling. You just have to have a pipeline full of of uh, prospect employee prospects that can come and work, and we're constantly interviewing. And you know we're thirty two employees now, so it's nice. like we just have to accept the fact that yo know, people are gonna leave and people are gonna come and accept it. And it's about every two or three months we go through another little hiring spree where I'll one, two, or three people and kind of nice. just go from there. When it comes That's to awesome. firing. Thank you. Um, when it comes to firing, yeah, I, I would definitely agree that sometimes you unfortunately need to um, let the person go. And uh, one thing that I've gotten better at is taking my ego out of play. And here's what I mean by this. When you hire someone and you think they're going to be really good at the job, well, obviously you're hiring them because you think they're going to be good at the right. job, I, I hope. Right. I hope. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so, not the uh, bigger problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. So it's an ego thing because you also have to admit that you made a mistake right. in hiring this person. And it's kind of right. like, damn, I thought this person was going to be great. They're not, clearly. Right. Uh, or maybe it's not the right fit. Maybe they don't fit into the culture, whatever it may be. And to kind of take your ego out of play and go, look, mm. you made a mistake. And realistically speaking, I mean, a lot of companies, I think the I was listening to the stat the other day. It's like, uh, it's high 50. This is like the general average 50% of a hires, like across all industries. Um, they're, they're like fired or that person leaves within six months. Like it's oh, a, it, it's just okay. the, it's just the reality of, you know, especially if you're scaling quickly and you're trying to hire people, you're going to make mistakes. Yeah. Um, and you just have to kind of cut the cord say, look, it's, it's not working out here. Sorry. Yeah, that makes sense. Move on, move on to the next one. It does Thank suck you. though. I, I hate firing people. I had to fire yeah. someone uh, recently. It's, I get nervous. I get it's terrible. But you got to get over with. Yeah, yeah. It's some it, like it's 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 part of the job. It sucks. Like I don't think any sane person or like nice person likes firing, including myself. But yeah. you do get better at it. Like in a weird way. Like I, yeah. mean, I still don't like it, but I've realized like yeah. it's kind of like breaking up. It's like you just got to get to the point. And so like a trick I learned. To, you know that hopefully maybe will help people because you know firing sucks but be empathetic see if you can help them out if i mean assuming it's like a good fire just because not a fit and it's not like something bad yeah but assuming it's like yeah. a regular case fire it's kind of like hey be empathetic but get to the point maybe be be you know supportive and helping them maybe find another job but i learned like the more you kind of like tiptoe and like, hey, I wanted to chat. And, and, and the, the longer you wait to say no, it, the no, harder no, it becomes. No, no, no. So like now I just go in the room and I just start right away. Like, hey, Curtis, there's no easy way to say this. We got to let you go. Yeah. And then I yeah. get into it because if I don't say it, just psychologically, yeah. it's this game where you keep prolonging and it just gets more and more like awkward to say it, you know? 
and and they, they they could see that they know it if, yeah. if, if 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 you're skating i mean just get it over with yeah so it's yeah. I, i'm the exact same way and it was actually the uh, lawyer's orders and just for uh, employment law and just stuff like that they go right to, to be uh, anyone yeah and i don't know what it's like and i don't know the the laws and i'm not familiar with the um, employment employ uh, blah, employment laws in florida but i know here anything under two years of employment you don't have to give them a reason Okay. Um, it's cold as hell. It's cold. Yeah. But because uh, we've had problems in the past where I tried to be really, really, really nice and, and opens up a can of worms. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're going to the, uh, the like here, it's Labor, government's yeah. a lot more involved in everything than in Florida. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can go on for days about that. But yeah. so they'll go to, it's called the, the uh, noms de travail. So it's, mm. it's for, for the viewers. Yeah. And then next thing you know, they're investigating, they're doing this. So I found someone under two years. It's like whether you like them or not, just like, dude miss whatever they are it's not working out yeah and uh unfortunately it, it, it is cold uh but it's what's necessary if you're going to run a business yeah no i agree and it's it's funny you mentioned that because i've unfortunately experienced that too where the the irony of like the ones that you really try to be overly nice to and figure things out and like but those are the ones that end up biting you back and next thing you know late and it's like you're like man yeah like i was actually trying to be nice and look what happened so it, it causes you to just be more strict and not that not that it's not nice but just you know it, it's a business decision you just got to be more to the point and more direct right yeah i mean it's like you know it's it's nice to be to hang out with your co-workers and stuff but uh a lot of times it's i i might like you as, a, as an employee it's i will like you if you're an employee here but yeah. like, you're not my friend right right separating that that line yeah, I, yeah I, I, it's it's yeah it's and like again it, it's cold but this is just the reality of of doing what you need to do and i've been in the same scenario you know i've made a lot of fires i've had to hire a lot of people too and you realize that when you're overly nice uh people not everyone but you'll eventually get taken advantage of yeah. so i've kind of built that wall up to kind of keep that professionalism like kind of yeah. separate the the two yeah, that makes sense. And I'd love to hear, like coming from, you know, a third generation uh, insurance family, like how do you, I guess, balance the, the the legacy of, you know, maybe traditional insurance practices, but also kind of, you know, adapting digital, uh, you know, tactics and then, you know, more common tactics, I guess. I'd love to hear kind of like how you balance both sides of, of, of the spectrum. Well, I mean, t in today's day and age, if you don't have a sexy website and you don't have a digital um, a digital space playbook, I think you're kind of already buying the eight ball. You know, if you're yeah. a company, every company should be, uh, you don't have to be 100% uh, digitized, but you should have a digital strategy. And if you are if you don't, I think you're leaving money on the table. So that part there, um, that's one of the reasons. The second reason is I actually thoroughly enjoy uh, digital marketing. So I can't code but I've learned a lot about SEO. I've learned a lot about paid ads. I've learned a lot about, like I got ripped off by a couple of marketing companies. I said, <laughs> you know what, F fuck this. I'm gonna learn it myself. There you go. And so I would, I would literally go to work and then I go home and I would just watch like two, three hours of YouTube videos about SEO, for example. And uh, over the years I've learned a lot and we get a lot of, we generate a lot of traffic and a lot of leads and a lot of business uh, coming from online. But to answer this, awesome. the, the first part of your question, you still need to have, because there's different types of clientele and there is still a big bulk of clientele that want to have that hands-on white glove service. Mm. So we try and give the best of both worlds. We try and give a service for people that example, for example, they don't mind leaving a voicemail, but they want to speak to the exact same person every single time. Right. And, and that's fine. And then there's the other type of clientele that go, I don't care who I speak to. I just want to get the answer as quickly as possible and just give me an answer. Right. And we have a solution for that as well. So we're trying to find like a balance between the two. And um, it's, 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 I guess you can call it like a hybrid approach. Like we haven't completely abandoned the insurance broker, insurance agency model, which typically speaking, when people think of an insurance broker, they think, like a better service as opposed right. to like calling Geico or something right. like that. And in many cases it is, but we try and give the best of both worlds. Cause a lot of people from Geico go, dude, I don't need to speak to the same person. Just give me the best price and give me an answer right. quickly. So right. we try and give that too. That makes sense. That makes sense. And you know, I noticed, you know, seeing stuff 
from you on LinkedIn that, you know, on the digital side, first of all, it's super cool that you got into SEO, that you kind of took the, the bull by the horn. So lesson Thanks. there, like, I think like you could, you know, for people listening, like sometimes don't be scared as an entrepreneur, get your hands dirty, learn new skills, like always be learning. Um, yes. But on, on the flip side, like, you know, I see you kind of going pretty hard on content and just the fact yeah. that the show speaks to that, but you also yeah. kind of have your own podcast yeah. going. So I'd love, oh, yeah, hear, baby. Yeah, I'd love to hear about Can that. I make can I, can I make a shameless plug? Yeah, of course. That's why <laughs> yeah, so I got a, yeah, I got a, a so shameless plug alert. Uh, I got a podcast called the Freemium Podcast. So it's basically uh, business conversations. We've actually kind of uh, evolved a little bit into like geopolitics and stuff too. Okay. I love, I'm a big podcast guy. I love listening to, I'm sure some of your listeners listen to the All In Podcast mm. with uh, Chimat. Those guys are awesome. And it's a good Balance, I find you get a little bit of business, get a little bit of politics, get a little bit of VC, you get a little bit of science. I, I find it kind of, I'm just interesting in a, like a lot of different topics. Right. And the reason why I started the podcast, because I was like, okay, hey, we need to be pumping out content. There's no excuse not to be pumping out content. There, there really isn't. People go, oh, I'm too busy, I'm too this, I'm too that. No, no, fuck off. You're, yeah. you're, you should be pumping everyone's out Everyone's got content. time. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's got time. And a lot of times people are shy to do it, and that's fine. Um, but so I thought, I said, okay, how am I gonna do content? And a podcast was the easiest way to do content. Cause you literally just have a conversation. You can chop it up, get the clips and pump yep. that out as the content. So I'm like, that's a lot easier than, you know, having a, a videographer or like with a camera and your face all day trying to get, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's a Big lot. Time. Cause I've done, I've done the vlog style content too. People think it's just off the cuff. Dude, there's a lot of organization that goes into filming a vlog if you yeah. want it to be good. Yeah. So I'm like, number one, it's going to be the easiest. Number two, um, hope, well, hopefully, obviously, the people enjoy it. And I yeah. enjoy having conversations with people. And number three, the reason why I came up with the podcast was, well, I knew, like I said, I, we had to, to, to brand our way. Uh, I don't have the budget to go against a company like Geico. And Geico's message is, you know, they have great branding, great advertising. Geico's message is, is obviously, you know, call, save, uh, quote Geico and save 50, 50 minutes to save you 50% of more. Right, right, right. You know, I mean, how many people, it, it's crazy that a lot of people, they know that slogan. Right. So the big guys, generally speaking, their message is save money, save money, save money, save money, save money. And that's, that, that's fine. That, that works, obviously. I can't go head to head with a company like Geico because I don't have the budget. And so I said, well, I'm not gonna just basically have the same message with a smaller budget. I need to kind of go at this differently. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to build an audience. We're having success, it's, it takes a lot of work, but we're having yeah. success building that audience. And now we're just starting to kind of cross over the freemium podcast audience into the, um, I guess you call it KBD insurance audience, which is a lot less because people hate insurance. Right. So I'm trying to kind of just make that crossover and I'll be the face of it. And my, my hope is when people see the freemium podcast over time, they'll associate my personal brand and the, and the freemium podcast to the fact that I also sell insurance. Right. And hopefully eventually I can monetize the, the, um, the viewers, the users uh, eventually as well. Like yeah. I'm just gonna be honest. Uh, of course, everyone That's is great. anyone who does a podcast or any type of, of, of video content. I mean, there's some self-interest. Uh, at the end of the day, anyone who yeah. goes, oh, I just do this for everyone else. Like, fuck off your line. Yeah. Just like, yeah, yeah, what, yeah. what's, <laughs> there's something in it, you know, you get to express your opinions or exactly. you get to make money off it. You get to, everyone has um, a motive at the end of the day. That makes sense. And, and it's funny you say it cause like on my end, genuinely what I found and, and people have different forms. Some people like writing, so they like Twitter or X. Some people like yeah. video, some people, and similar to you, I actually, when I started doing podcasts, I genuinely enjoyed it. I was like, oh, I actually like this. Like, I like talking to people. It's actually fun. Yeah. Like, you know, certain things give you energy, certain things take energy. For me, podcasts yeah. was one of the ones that surprised me. Every time I did it, I was like excited to do another one. So on yeah, that same. side, I selfishly want to continue. But to your point, and for people listening, it's a great hack to build uh, short form content. Because to your point, I just want to highlight it is like, Think about pillar pieces of content, and it could be mm -hmm. a blog, but blogs do take more work. It could be a podcast, but when you have long form pillar pieces of content, it becomes so much easier to have a team, or if you're good, you can do it yourself, but slice and dice that into short form and repurpose it for different platforms, whether it's YouTube shorts, TikToks, Instagrams, and it's it's amazing what can happen. And even on, on our side, on the business side, we started going a lot harder on like content, 
and like we're seeing like leads come in from like our Instagram like LinkedIn bio and we're like wow like even we we're like wow people actually do that so it's really cool to see the reach you can get and just being top of mind in people's feeds um, yeah so anyways just want to share that with people like don't sleep on that if you're on the fence about like should I do content uh, we had an interesting guest not too long ago that I love this tagline Sean uh, Walsh he goes um, be the story, not the commercial. So most people are thinking about like how to do an ad, how to do a creative for like the commercial, but why not be the main story, be the episode itself? Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, it's like a lot of people who make this type of content, um, are in the same boat as me in the sense that they don't have the budget to go head to head against these multinational corporations or these big multi-billion dollar corporations. I mean, you're not gonna win. You yeah. have to go at it from a different angle. You don't have uh, $5 million to do a 30 second Super Bowl <clears throat> commercial. So, and also too, like people, I mean, when I, the way I always try and explain this to the people, it's like, People are addicted to their phones. Like that's yeah. a whole other conversation. Like I'm addicted yeah. to my phone too. You probably are. Like, everyone's yeah, yeah. addicted to their phone, and yeah. it's disgusting at the end of the week when you look. You have an iPhone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You look at the hours. Yeah, and, yeah. and everyone, yeah, everyone's just like, and you ask people, "What's your hours?" Oh, I don't want to know. So it's like, yeah. and everyone says that, right? So, but so let's say for example, on average, people are probably on their phone five hours a day. Probably, yeah. it's crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. So when they're seeing the content, whether it's me, whether it's you, whether it's whoever, it's like. It's like a billboard on the highway. It's the same thing. Right. And even though they might not like it, even though they might not leave a comment, if they keep seeing your stuff, they keep seeing your content, when they finally are ready to make that decision, so I'll just speak for insurance yeah. example, yeah. when they are ready to you know, get that new car, they are ready to open up a new business, they are ready to shop their current insurance, hopefully we're top of mind mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully they reach out. And it's, it's to the, your point, it definitely works. Yeah. It works. It's a lot of work. But yeah. it works. Yeah, and being top of mind, I forget the stat, but it's something like someone has to see your thing. Like, I don't want to misquote, but I don't know if it's like seven, 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 okay, seven, okay, so seven, seven yeah. times, right? So knowing that, it's like, and I agree with you about the whole top of mind thing because I've seen it where people might not like the post or share the post. Like to the public, it might be like, ah, oh, this has got six likes, but I'll literally get DMs or LinkedIn messages being like, hey, keep up the good work with the content. You're always on my feed, but in my head, yeah. I'm like, but you never like my post. But it doesn't yeah. matter. But it's interesting no. just to see people are seeing but for whatever reason, there's effort in liking, so they're not liking. So for people who are on the fence, one of the things that worked for me, and I'd love to hear how you kind of handle in the early days of starting with content, but one tip that I'd love to share that worked for me was when I started pushing content, I said, you know what, instead of measuring like the likes or the views for the first like 90 days or first like, you know, six months, all I'm gonna do is measure my output. So like, what can I control? So if I wanna output at let's say 10 shorts a week, that's my measure of success. Did I hit 10 shorts this week? Great. Did I hit 10 shorts? Great. And just by switching it from measuring the output versus like looking at likes and views in the early days, it took so much weight off my shoulders. So that's just a little hack, but I love to hear from you in the early days when you first started doing content, what were maybe some things that, that you learned, um, you know, to maybe get into it? A little trick that I actually learned is if you're embarrassed to post your own content, which most people are, because they're, you're, you know, you're, I guess you could say vulnerable. I don't know if that's the right word, but like you're putting your opinion, you're putting your face out there onto the internet. The yeah. internet's not a very nice place. Yeah. <laughs> and so you're opening yourself up to criticism, right? And a lot of times people aren't going to agree with you mm -hmm. uh, or they might just shit talk you. You know, you get yeah. some bum or some loser who's probably sitting in his basement scratching his ass all day, he doesn't even have a job <laughs> and he'll like just shit talk you and all this kind of stuff. And yeah. it sometimes it, it bothers me and I've gotten a lot better now. My, my favorite, I, I learned this one from your brother. If you get like a nasty comment, you just go like, go to your room or something <laughs> like that. Just dumb shit like that, have fun with it. But to answer the question, I guess, uh, what was my measure of success? I didn't really have one. We had a plan like you, like, okay, we're gonna put out, uh, I think we originally started, and we're constantly changing it. I think we originally started with like five TikToks, five shorts, five reels, and that's all more or less it's the same right. piece of content. Right. Um, so we kind of start with that. We track our views and stuff, but I mean, every month we look at the total impressions and organically across between KBD insurance and between freemium, we're running at about like, I think it's 150,000 um, impressions awesome. per, per month. And it's not a lot, it's not crazy, no, but, it's, but it's, it's, it's better. It's, 
yeah, no, it's good. People sleep on that. Like that's 150,000 more impressions than you would have had, you know? Yes. Yeah. And like it, it definitely works. It just takes a long time. And here's like another interesting stat for people that, you know, are, are probably, they want to start a podcast. They just don't know how, or, you know, maybe it's too expensive or whatever it may be. The, so the crazy stat, if you've produced over uh, 10 episodes of podcast episodes, yeah. And you've been running consistently uh, for more than two months. You're already in the top five percent of podcasts. Wow. So you and I are in the top five percent. Wow. And the reason being, most people don't. They start it. How many times do you see a podcast that starts? You get this big, uh, yeah. like a big promotional item and all that kind of stuff, and yeah. then three months later, it doesn't exist anymore. Stops. Yeah. So most people start it and then they stop. So just at the point I'm alluding to is consistency. Just That's keep doing it. And, and and how many stories do you have? I mean, Gary Vee said the same thing. Logan Paul said the same thing. These guys are superstars. Logan Paul said he was sitting on 4,000 subs on YouTube for like five years. And I look at the guy, the guy's a superstar today. Yeah. So it's like, just keep going, keep going, keep going. Absolutely. And you know what? Yeah, maybe you won't ever make it, but like, don't. I don't think like that. I think like, no, one day, you know, you're, you're one video away from popping off and going viral. So that's the way I keep telling myself. Yeah, no, I agree. And the other thing that I find interesting and, and, and I'd love to get your opinion on this is when I first started content, I actually thought of it more just from like, oh, okay, this will be great for awareness. And like you said, marketing and maybe getting some more leads being top of mind. But it also started helping on other areas of the business, like partnerships and like hiring. So there was yeah. interviews I did. Oh, like, yeah. yeah, I watch your YouTube video. I actually oh, really yeah. impressed on like why you started Whisk and then your story. And I'm like, you watch it? It's only got like 700 views, but thank you. You know, so it's interesting. So I'd love to hear from you, like on the, you know, we talked about the client side. What about, let's say on the hiring side, how is content it, help? It's a great question. And absolutely, I totally agree with you. The amount of people that today, okay, this is, this is how people get hired today. <clears throat> it's one of two ways. You either already, and I'll speak for myself, either I know them already very well personally, which is a completely different pitch to someone who's, who's gonna be an employee. They probably already have a good idea of what the company is. That's the first one. The second one is, you know, a lot of people that post ads on Indeed or they'll post ads on, I don't know, somewhere on the internet. Right. right. If that person is serious and they're actually interested in joining your company, where are they gonna go first? They're gonna go to your website. Right. And then they're probably gonna go to your Facebook or your Instagram page Correct. or today more and more TikTok page and stuff like that. If you don't have sexy content on a place like that, and especially for trying to hire millennials or younger, if you don't have that good content and let's say you go into the Instagram page and it's all clunky and shit content and it's like it's just not a good page, right? They're going to think, oh, this is probably like a boomer's office. Mm. This is probably you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. And so, and the amount of times that we've hired people, and I'll ask them like, "Hey, what made you, what made you come here?" It's a few things. A lot. Of, it helps if they know coworkers there. That always helps. Right. Referrals. Uh, yeah, that that def. I'm not gonna say it doesn't. It does. But the second thing is to go. Yeah, I saw your Facebook or I saw your Instagram That's content awesome. all the time. It gives me a really good idea of what the culture is like in the That's office, cool. and cultures. Uh, it's a very important thing today um what well, always has been if you're going to spend the majority of your time at work you want it to be a place that you have a sense of belonging you want to be it you want it to be a place that you know you, you feel good going uh going to and stuff like that yeah. so long story short instagram it, it gives a good um inside picture into how the organization runs and yeah. the cult the culture of the of the organization yeah, makes a ton of sense. So, so like, you know, people sleeping on content, there's another reason apart from clients, apart from awareness, uh, hiring and employees. And yeah, oh, yeah, it's awesome. And my favorite part of content is the leverage, right? You do it once, that YouTube video is up, and yep. then someone might watch it in two weeks, and someone might watch it in a month. But like the idea that it's like one, you know, and sometimes it, it could be more time consuming, but it's one piece of work for a lot of infinite output, I guess, like infinite yeah. uh, views, you know, which is, which is amazing. Um, totally so tur turning the tune and speaking of culture, right? That's one thing a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with, especially as you're scaling, right? So, you know, you, you I, yeah. I believe you have one office and now you guys open a second office. So like, you know, yeah. as you're scaling, how do you, how do you think about culture and how do you kind of try to keep that, that culture as you grow? Cause you know, it, it, it's one thing when you're five people, but as you keep on growing, you know, you're 32 now, what do you do and how do you think about culture? It's really important. Um, and the people, 
when you're when you're under a hundred people, um, I heard this from Reid Hoffman, and I agree with it. Uh, he's the founder of LinkedIn. For those that don't know, um, <clears throat> he said the first hundred hires are your cultural co-founders. Mm. So you want to make sure that your first hires, like if you're the owner of the business, you should be pretty hands-on. You don't have to be the one like directly doing the interview, but you should have a very good idea of who's getting hired. You should be able to speak to them before you hire right. that person. Like you, you should be very involved in the hiring process if you're below um, 100 people. I'm the same way, I'm, I'm quite involved um, in the hiring process as well. Um, when it comes to culture too, like if you get a cancer, get rid of them right away. And also too, what I, what I like to do is I will speak to the Call them die, not diehards, but like the people who like they enjoy being here. Yeah, yeah. and I'll, I'll I'll give them permission to be like, guys, if you see some bullshit that doesn't belong here in the office, I give you permission to literally like self police and get these guys the fuck out of here. So if someone comes in with that just a nasty attitude, if they're a cancer, if they're infecting other people, it's like employees. If you have a good culture, they will self police anyways. Mm -hmm. And that person won't stay for long. You probably won't even have to fire them. They'll just quit because the employees will bully them or the employees will be like, I'm not dealing with this person. Get the fuck out of here. You know what I mean? That's so yeah. you got to stay away from the fucking politics, man. Like people are, you're here to do a job. And don't, if you want to do political stuff on your own free time, go for it. Like, I don't care if you're Republican. I don't care if you're Democrat. I don't give a shit. You're here to do a job. I don't care if you're independent. You're here to do a job. Don't bring that political bullshit right. into the office. And I'm not here to be a social justice warrior and to fight all these other causes. I'm worried about fucking running the business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I got so enough like, stress. Don't, I don't, yeah. don't, don't put pressure on me to uh, post something when everyone else is doing it and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And it's nice to see more and more organizations standing up to employees yeah. who are demanding this. And it's like gotten to the point now, I find the employees, are, they're borderline like bullying management yeah. or are trying to. Right. All right. So yeah, it's like, so it's causes. Yeah. Like just, if you're the leader of a company, like it's you, you, the short term might be more, there might be more turmoil in the short term if you have to address it, but it's going to sooner or later need to be addressed anyways. Yeah. So yeah. if you get, if you get like a, you know, a social justice where it's, it's distracting from the, the vision and the cause of the company itself, yeah. you're, unf you're going to have to get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I agree. Honestly, it's like that whole that 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 what is it? Uh, you know, one bad apple spoils a bunch. It's it's such a true thing, and it's it's just you know I've seen that sometimes even on let's say the more technical side where you find someone who's like really good, and then you uh, like technically let's say a programmer uh, or yeah. you know an SEO specialist, right? Like someone who's super good technically. So then you you, you kind of become and the mistake I made, but you become a bit more lenient on like their attitude because they're so good on the other side. Mistake I learned years ago. Now it's like yeah, listen, yeah. it doesn't matter how smart someone is or how good they are technically. <coughs> if they're bad emotionally and like culture wise, it does affect other people. And like it's one of the best ways. In, I mean, in a negative way, but it's one of the best ways to demotivate good people on your team is to have bad people around. Like nothing demotivates good people than seeing like people that are not that great and that are sticking around or that are just like bad attitude. So yes. it's like a double whammy, right? Like one is and, they're bad and then they're affecting the people around them. <laughs> and the, the other part to where it's just like you're all you're doing as a leader of a company, you're just kicking the can down the road because you're eventually going to have to address it anyway. Exactly. Right. So just get it out of the way. And like, yeah, if you have an asshole developer, I don't know what it is like about fucking developers, man. Like, I, I, I'm sorry. A lot of you guys, you're fucking assholes. Like, it's <laughs> just like, there's some nice ones, but man, it's like, they're so, uh, they're kind of arrogant. Like, oh, what, what are you stupid? Like, you don't know how to do this? Like, no, I don't know how to code. Fuck. That's what I hired you for. But uh, anyways, that's my, that's my stint on developers. I'm talking shit about them because we don't have developers in house anymore. So that's <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's funny. No, we're lucky. So, honestly, I don't have to look no, no, but we're lucky. We actually have like a solid team. I got to give them credit. Like super That's nice good. people. And like, you know, they're good when they've been around for like four years, five years, which is rare for like a developer. So like, yeah, yeah, big time. Preventatively, the better you hire and the more structure you have in hiring and what you look for and maybe scorecards and the interview process, the more you can do there, the better. So that's one advice I have for people listening is like the hiring part is pretty important. And the better you get at hiring, not only reading people, but giving them little projects to try or, or certain questions that go a bit deeper and the better sense you get, I think, you know, ideally you'll have less of those situations. But when you do, to your point, I think you got to, you know, cut them quickly. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and I think one thing I'd love to know from you really is is I'm always interested in learning like founders like stories. So it sounds like you're doing well. So kudos. It sounds like teams growing. You're now in two offices and hopefully more and more and more growth. But like, what got you into this? Obviously, I know it's some family, but like, what got you into this in the first place? And then I love to just hear your journey, like how you first got into this, and then what the what the growth trajectory looked like from you know starting to where you are today. Sure. So I'm I'm uh, I'm lucky enough where my uh, it, it it's in the Killen family. A lot of people go into insurance. So my grandfather started this company back in the '70s. He's no longer with us. He passed away years ago. So he came over from Scotland, um, started up uh, this business. So KBD's Killen, Bullard, and Divine. So those are two other partners back in the day. We'll get into all that. Um, and then my father worked at KBD Insurance. Uh, he actually eventually. He went off on his own actually. And so he sold a company to another insurance agency um, about 12 years ago. Okay. Well. And he was and he was bored at this time. And uh, he wanted to kind of get back into insurance, I guess. And uh, his brother, so my uncle was running KBD insurance. So my dad purchased the shares of KBD. And then, um, so it's, now it's back into my, my father, Gary. So it's right. back um, in, in our direct family, I guess you can say. And one day, so we're raking the leaves. Like I had finished school. I wasn't a very good student. I studied in marketing and stuff like that, but I was a shit student. I I just (laughs) wanted to get out of there. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I I was just like, oh, whatever. I'm like, maybe I'll work in insurance. Maybe I won't, wasn't sure. And so one day we're raking the leaves and I was still living at home, like 23. I'm living at home. He goes, okay, uh, you're going to start on Monday. I'm just (laughs) like, okay, cool. And I had to pass the exams and stuff. So I started off doing cold calling for like four months, just straight up cold calling. I got a list, called them up, got their expiry dates for the insurance and would try and call back. It worked. I, I got pretty good at it. Um, so when I started, it was it was it was a, it was always a mom and pop shop. We were like two people when I first started, uh, we got to three, then got to four. And then I'm like, hey, I, I like this and uh, like, uh, let's let's grow this. And I wanted to grow it. And we have been successful growing it because of the team and the people that uh, that we've hired. And uh, yeah, that's like long story short, kind of what it is. It, basically, awesome. I came in, it was already in the family. So that base was there. It's a small company, very, very, very small. And I'm not saying we're, we're huge today. No, no, but still to take it from, you know, two people to 32 people is, is not an easy feat. So like, who, yeah, who it turned like yeah. the revenue generated. I've been in for 11 years now. We're, we're 10x the revenue of, of when I started that's back awesome. then. So it's like, and I'm one of those guys, I'm sure it's the same thing for a lot of your audience. I can't, I can't sit still when things are running smoothly, like great, but I'll go work on something else because I don't want to just sit there all day and go oh wow everything's fantastic and like what am I going to do now so I'm always trying to do new projects and keep myself busy and stuff like that that's awesome and let me let me ask you this what is next for KBD right so you're on a great trajectory I know you recently I think but was it was it recent the second office or yeah uh, we opened it up uh, a year ago approximately okay in Ottawa. okay so pretty recent second office in Ottawa um, yeah. What's next for you guys, right? From two to thirty-two employees, ten x revenue. In the, you know, since you started, like things are definitely heading in the right direction, and it sounds like you're doing well. What's next for you? Where would you like to see KBD in the next uh, few years? I'd like to go to Alberta. I'd like to go to Alberta, and then just because of like the uh, you know less regulation and stuff like that, because it's like Canada. I, I sound like a broken record, but it's like just a lot of red tape, man. Mm. Holy shit! There's red tape in this country. <laughs> Oh, I could go on for days. <laughs> we're getting close on time, so I won't. But right, Alberta, the red tape, yeah. Alberta, the red tape is is significantly less in places like uh, Ontario and Quebec. Um, I, I would really love to one day go down to your beautiful state of Florida. Florida, I love it. Yeah. And I, and I'm not kidding either. I would love to go there, have like a nice condo, open up like a little just you know two three employees or something like that and um, get started down there that's that's a lot more complicated step one is i want to be in alberta yeah and step two i would i would honestly look at going down into florida i love the attitude of florida i love the i visit florida you know two three times a year i just love the whole ethos of florida um yeah i like it down there and the weather is a, l- a little bit nicer than, than up here in montreal, <laughs> in montreal yeah, so. yeah it helps the yeah. weather helps that yeah that helps yeah that's awesome well curtis if you end up coming you said you come two times a year let me know i'm here now so i will would love to catch you and thank you thank you for sharing your story your journey as an entrepreneur it sounds like you're having a ton of success so to continued success cheers to you my friend and thank you for being on the show you as well angelo